Hello and welcome to another installment of this series on games that are exclusive to the Amiga. Today we're looking at 20 platform games that were never ported from the good old Miggy. Although the Amiga had some decent platformers, a lot of the well known ones were ported to other systems or were arcade ports themselves. Let's have a look at 20 that never left the Amiga. First up is Arabian Nights which was developed and published by Chrysalis Software in 1993 and also came to the CD32. You play as Sinbad Jr across 10 levels full of secret passages which can usually be accessed by bashing at bricks with your sword or accessing passages by pressing down and fire. Levels are set across a range of themed locations including underwater on a ship and in an ice fortress. You start off imprisoned in a dungeon which you have to escape from. To make it off of a level, you'll need to employ the assistance of characters you meet along the way. They usually need some kind of item or payment and in turn will give you an item or perform a specific task which allows you to progress. If they want payment, you'll need gems and coins found throughout the level. These are often in the secret rooms with an insufficient amount being in the main areas so finding them can be vital to completing the level. You can access your inventory at any time by pressing spacebar where you can see how much cash you have at the time. This is also required to select keys you've collected to open doors which is quite annoying, would have been better if they were just used automatically. Sinbad Jr is armed with a scimitar, combat is a bit naff unless you manage to find a weapon upgrade and having to press up to jump is annoying but that's something of which almost all of the platform games on the Amiga are guilty. For the most part it's your standard platforming affair which has quite speedy movement but there's also a section involving riding in a minecart and side scrolling shooter sections on a magic carpet. You have a certain amount of hit points shown at the bottom left up to a maximum of 5, this can be set in the settings menu and of course you can collect health top ups in the game. Overall Arabian Nights is a decent little platformer, it looks great with colourful cartoony graphics and although they're not particularly thrilling the shooter sections break up the game nicely. The highlight is probably the music which fits the theme perfectly and is very catchy indeed. Blob was developed by Jonathan Hillard, published by Core Design in 1993. A 3D puzzle platformer, this is certainly not your traditional platform game, instead played top down. You control a blob bouncing on floating platforms made of different tiles, with the aim being to reach the level's exit or perform some sort of assigned task. Sometimes you have to rescue other smaller blobs before heading to the exit. The only control is jumping done by holding down fire. You need to jump up and down in 3D between the floating platforms, many of which will be difficult to see as they're above or below you. This can make the jumps very precise and tricky and can be terribly frustrating when you miss one. Different tiles have different effects, for example being extra bouncy or conversely dulling your jumps. There are also enemies and turrets. As frustrating as it can be, it certainly has that one more go factor and the game's password feature certainly helps. Just don't be surprised if you find yourself swearing at your Amiga screen. It has very jolly music and whimsical boings, although I can see the music drilling a hole in your brain after a while. Cool idea for a game though, that harks back to early 80s arcade games. Lionheart also released in 1993 was developed and published by Thalion Software. This is an action platformer in a fantasy setting. Your character has a sword, but swinging it involves pressing attack and a direction which is far from ideal. This gives him various sword strikes, but they can be awkward to pull off quickly. Also it means you can't use your sword while moving, although you can do while performing some actions like in mid-air after a jump or when swinging from a rope. The presentation is superb here. The graphics are pretty excellent and were done by Henk Nieborg, and the music is sinister, moody and atmospheric, fitting the fantasy theme well. The backgrounds are a highlight, gorgeous pink and purple sunset skies with parallax clouds. Some levels are far more detailed than others though, with some being just plain colours. The player character is nicely animated too. 
Sadly, the gameplay doesn't meet the same high standard for me. It's just too slow paced for my liking, but my main niggle is the fiddly combat controls. Looks and sounds fantastic, but doesn't do it for me personally. A lot of people seem to disagree, so give it a try and judge for yourself. Assassin was developed by Psionic Systems, published by Team17 in 1992. You're an assassin armed with the go-to weapon of any self-respecting contract killer. A boomerang? You can choose the direction in which the boomerang is thrown and it has quite poor range. Upgrades can be collected though, which alter their number, throwing distance, power and speed. There are also two boomerang power-up modes to choose from. Manual, which lets you alter the effect of power-ups by throwing your boomerang at them, and automatic, which just plays as intended with power-ups having a fixed effect. There are also special weapon power-ups like homing missiles, proximity mines, flaming attacks and robotic walkers. Collected special weapons are shown at the bottom. Holding down fire cycles through them, then you stop on your selected weapon. Not an ideal way to select a weapon. The assassin can climb on ceilings and walls, definitely a strider vibe here. He even has a similar flip up to platform above move. The aim is to reach the exit and there are five maze-like levels which are very large indeed. There's also a strict time limit, although there are power-ups that add extra time. After the time limit runs out, you don't immediately fail, but the game does immediately get harder. Enemies can be human, robot or turrets, but they can be few and far between, making the levels feel a bit too sparse at times. There's no in-game music, just ambient sound effects like wind or mechanical humming, or the occasional screaming woman randomly, and minimal sound effects. There is some decent speech, like a male voice which directs you where to go if you've collected the relevant power-up, or a female voice that announces collected pickups. Extra energy. The lack of music is really noticeable. A special edition was released in 94 which changes several things including making the protagonist cybernetically enhanced and changes the boomerang to a projectile weapon. I think I actually prefer it to the boomerang. Unfortunately, Assassin's fast and fluid movement is let down by what can at times be quite boring gameplay, but Assassin is a decent albeit flawed little action platformer. Shadow of the Beast 3 is the third in the series of games by Reflections, published in 1992 by Psygnosis. The Shadow of the Beast series is renowned for really showing off what the Amiga could do in terms of graphics and sound, and was quite jaw-dropping in the day. It's also known for its mediocre and at times frustrating gameplay. The third game was arguably the most playable in the trilogy, and fixed some of the issues its predecessors had. Unfortunately, it was less well known, partly due to it being an Amiga exclusive, unlike the first two games. A Mega Drive port was planned, but was ultimately scrapped. The gameplay is in principle the same, action platforming with a heavy emphasis on puzzle solving, usually involving mechanical traps and contraptions with levers and so on. You're controlling a guy in human form for once, and he has a little shuriken boomerang thing for a weapon which I actually really like. It can still be frustrating, just like the previous games, and often I find it impossible to avoid taking damage. The graphics are as always great, but the music is probably the weakest of the series. It's still very good, producing an atmosphere appropriate for the game, but it just doesn't have that spine-tingling wow factor that the first two games had with their exceptional soundtracks. The game is very short at only four stages, but a welcome change is that you get to pick from two of them at the game's start. Shadow of the Beast 3 isn't the greatest puzzle platformer, but the most accessible of the trilogy in terms of playability. Traps and Treasures was developed by Roman Werner, initially published by Starbyte Software in Germany in 1993 and then in English by Chrysalis in 1994. You control a pirate called Flynn, and as the name suggests, your aim is to collect treasure and avoid traps. Flynn has a dagger to begin with, but you can buy better weapons later on. He can also stomp on blocks Mario style, but your weapon can't be used in mid-air, which is a bit annoying sometimes when you're jumping onto platforms that have enemies on them. Similarly, you can't use weapons in water either, and unfortunately the first level is almost entirely underwater. This makes it quite laborious, avoiding taking damage from the many sea creatures roaming the waters. 
you have five health points in your life bar at the start at the top left there but this can be increased you can also collect fruit which fills up your vitamin bar at the top right which will restore a health point when full as well as fruit you can collect coins which can be spent in shops found throughout the levels where you can purchase health and weapons loot is sometimes lying around the level or might be in chests and you can collect pieces of treasure maps which open up bonus stages traps and treasures looks pretty good the graphics are cartoony and colorful and i liked the character design the music isn't much to write home about but it's not bad either but overall a fairly well presented game the gameplay is just too slow paced to make this fun especially the first level where you just spend a lot of time swimming around I like platform games to keep the action moving, and this just feels like it's doing the opposite. Mr. Nuts Hoppin' Mad is a Mr. Nuts sequel released by Ocean in 1994, developed by Neon Studios and Kaiko. It's quite different to the original Mr. Nuts, which never made it to the Amiga after being cancelled, and interestingly, Hoppin' Mad was planned for the Mega Drive, but cancelled. The reason it's so different is this was actually developed with a different title and playable character, but Ocean changed it to a Mr. Nuts sequel when they took on the publishing. I really wanted this game to be good as it looks fantastically vibrant and very like an early 90s Sega platform game would. In fact, I'm quite sure they wanted this to be like Sonic as you can see a clear influence in the levels and some of the textures and a Sonic-like bonus stage. Mr. Nuts even rolls into a ball like Sonic. You can also collect feathers which allow Mr. Nuts to glide through the air like Mario. There's also a Mario style overworld map to navigate but it's a bit drawn out and in all honesty it would have been better off without it. Unfortunately beyond initial impressions the game just misses out on being great. Although the graphics are really chunky and quite stunning for an Amiga platformer the vibrant levels can be frustrating as enemies often blend in with the surroundings even camouflaging themselves. Spikes on walls will stop you in your tracks and rolling into enemies doesn't stop you from taking damage. This results in a very slow and deliberate playstyle that is quite the opposite of what made games like Sonic enjoyable. And this game has the potential to do better as the character can actually move very fast. The main culprit here is the level design which doesn't always promote constant and fluid motion. Disappointing really as it does have a lot going for it and I'm not saying it's a bad game by any means it's just it could have been a lot better with a few tweaks. But as console style platformers go, this is arguably one of the Amiga's most faithful. This is widely regarded as one of the Amiga's best platform games, so don't take my word for it, try it out yourself. Hoy was developed by Team Hoy, three young Belgians, published in 1992 by Software Business in Europe and Hollyware Entertainment in North America. You play as Hoy, a lizard or dinosaur of some sort. This is a weird game as it's really just jumping on platforms. Yes, I get that is the literal definition of the genre, but there's really nothing else going on. He can't attack any enemies and often you won't even see one for ages. He just jumps. It is, however, very hard. So if you like challenging platform games like that, then maybe worth a go, but not my cup of tea. Fuzzball was released in 1991, developed by Scan Games Norway and published by System 3. This was planned for the Commodore 64 and a two-level demo even featured on a magazine cover disc before it was subsequently cancelled. This is a really simple premise, but it's deceivingly difficult. You play as a little jumping ball. The levels are presented as single screens and all you have to do is collect all the items in the level. There are enemies walking around platforms, but they won't leave the confines of that platform unless attacked. To attack enemies, you fire little round projectiles, and that turns them into little bouncing balls. Grab the balls quickly, otherwise the enemies will transform into enemies of a different colour, which are more aggressive in behaviour. In this state, they'll leave the confines of their starting platform. Of course, this can be used to your advantage to draw them away from items, but they are pretty quick when like this and can catch you out easily. You do have the option of shooting them again, but it's risky. Often, it's just best to avoid them. It's quite tame, but it has a certain charm that I do like. And as I said, it's trickier than it may first appear.
Premiere was published by Core Design in 1992, developed by The Eighth Day, and came to the CD32 in 1994. In this platformer, you're playing as a film editor who's had his film reels stolen, and must travel through various film sets in order to recover them. There are six sets in all, each having a film reel to recover. The graphics are absolutely fantastic, being very cartoony with good colours. The artist Jero Carroll trained under Don Bluth, which might explain why the visuals are so gorgeously drawn. He was assistant animator for Don Bluth's 1989 film All Dogs Go to Heaven, among other things. Core Pictures present a film by the eighth day. The intro sequence is even wonderfully drawn and animated and is presented as one would expect film credits to be. Your only button, apart from pressing up to jump, is an action button. This performs various different actions, the first being attack, which if unarmed is just a short punch. If armed, it uses your currently assigned weapon. Each set has its own weapons, which fits in with the theme of the film set. For example, the first level is western themed, so the collectible weapon is dynamite, which can be thrown at enemies. Sometimes these projectiles have a throw distance that's just a bit too long, so attacking enemies can be tricky if they're too close. The other levels have some classic film genre themes like a horror set complete with Frankenstein's monster and a disembodied walking hand resembling Thing from the Addams Family, science fiction and even a black and white film era set. Unfortunately, despite the visual differences, the film sets feel mostly the same, more of a palette swap than a complete variation in design. The sets also feature nods to other core design games like Chuck Rock and Wolf Child, and sometimes there are even posters for fictional sequels to these games. The action button also pulls switches found throughout the set, which open up areas by opening doors or triggering platforms. The final use for the action button is its most annoying. In Premiere you can walk on two different planes, so you can jump in and out of the background just like in Guardian Heroes. This is done by pressing down an action, but it can be tricky to pull off unless you hold down first, then press action. This means that it takes a second to perform, which can prove very annoying when trying to jump to the other plane quickly. Enemies can only be attacked if you're on the same level as them, and equally, being at a different depth will help you avoid them. It would have been far better if they'd mapped this particular action to a second button. There are plenty of enemies and a lot of traps to avoid in the sets. Premiere is good fun and an often overlooked title on the Amiga, which is a shame because its graphics are absolutely lovely. Benefactor was released in 1994, developed by Digital Illusions aka DICE and published by Psygnosis. This also got a CD32 release the same year. This is a puzzle platformer whose puzzle elements are in principle very much like Lemmings. You control a human character through 60 cavernous levels, with the aim being to rescue these little alien creatures called Merry Men that have been imprisoned. These little creatures behave quite like lemmings, although are less suicidal, and even vaguely resemble them. All you need to really do is jump, although that can be more complicated than it sounds, as a lot of the jumps have to be very precisely pulled off. Get keys to the cells in which the merry men are imprisoned, free them, then they'll start to walk on a set path. The aim is to get all of them to the exit, again, exactly like lemmings. This will involve intervention from the player character, for example carrying the merry men, or lifting and throwing them up to higher platforms. There are also enemies to avoid and traps, although enemies won't attack the merry men. Your health bar is shown at the bottom, and losing all your life will of course result in failing the level. As well as from traps and enemies, health can be lost from fall damage, making those precise jumps even more vital. You'll also find switches to pull, which trigger certain things like platforms appearing, and the merry men sometimes have to be guided to a switch in order for them to pull it. Sometimes there are monochrome merry men which need to be coloured in before they can be guided to the exit, done by directing them under these painting machines once you've collected a paint can and filled it up. You'll notice how zoomed out the play area is, making your character very small on screen, which is quite unique. It is possible to get stuck at points, making the level unbeatable, so you'll need to quit and restart. There are no lives, you can try the levels again and again as many times as you'd like, and there is also a password feature, so not really an issue. Graphics are very nice indeed, although it perhaps has too much grey and brown, and it has some pretty decent music, with one track and accompanying level being a reference to Lemmings. 
but Benefactor is certainly distinct and a welcome riff on the Lemmings puzzles. Globjaw was developed by X Animo Designs and published by Psygnosis, coming to Amiga in 1992. It was planned for the Mega Drive, but was cancelled. A lot of Psygnosis games in this video, they really were staunch supporters of the Amiga. Globjaw is one of the most basic games on this list in terms of premise, but that doesn't make it easy or boring. This game has a certain charm that I really enjoy. You play as a pink blob, all you can do is crawl along the floor or jump, but the blob will stick to any surface, meaning he can climb on walls and ceilings. The aim is to collect all the diamonds on a level and get to the exit. Simple. You can also collect other items like fruit and cake, which will eventually grant extra lives. The levels gradually introduce things to you, which I appreciate. You start off getting to grips with the aim of the game and the physics, then it introduces other elements like keys to open doors, as well as traps and enemies. There are hidden areas to find too. But it's really the physics that make this game fun. Climb onto a wall or ceiling and press jump and your globjaw will fly off it at breakneck speed. Getting the angle of these jumps right is the key to collecting all the items in the level, but at the same time can be deadly as you can just as easily be flung into a hazard. Very basic, but sometimes simplicity is better. A fun little game this one. Brian the Lion was developed by Reflections and published by, you guessed it, Psygnosis in 1994 for the Amiga and CD32. This is really basic graphically and the gameplay is very generic platform affair. You just run through the levels as fast as you can and collect as many crystals as possible. These can be spent in the shop on various upgrades like increased speed, extra lives and so on. Enemies can be attacked with a swipe of Brian's claw or by jumping on their heads. The jumping is very floaty and just doesn't feel right at all. The only appeal I can really see for this game is for speed running as it rewards the speedy completion of the levels and the level designs are perfect for those willing to learn and master them with a lot of precise blind jumps and various routes to take. Odyssey was developed by Unconscious Minds published by Audiogenic Software in 1995. This is like an action platforming adventure with puzzle elements and is quite grand in scale. There are several levels, each being absolutely massive. You can select from a few of these at the start on the map, but some can only be accessed later on. Your young hero is armed with a sword for cutting down enemies. The main aim is to explore the sprawling stages in order to find crystals which grant you abilities which you'll need to access new areas. I suppose it's like Metroid, you'll revisit certain areas once you've unlocked the relevant ability. These abilities let you transform into all sorts of things that have unique talents. For example, a grasshopper that can jump really far, a bird or bat which can fly, a spider that will let you access narrow passageways, a squirrel to travel across ropes. You can even transform into a rock. You trigger these transformations by pressing F7. Other than that, the only button is an action button which swings your sword or uses levers. Levers trigger passages to open and so on, and you'll also find floor switches and keys for doors throughout the levels. Some are decoys though and will trigger harmful traps. It looks brilliant, the player character is animated really well, and despite the monotonous colour palette, the levels are really atmospheric. Add to this the eerie silence, there's no in-game music, just the whistling of wind which sounds kind of like you're wearing headphones on an aeroplane. But the sound effects can be really excellent at times, like the echoing sound of footsteps in a cavern. There's a lot of going to and fro, and the huge levels can be a bit intimidating, but if you like exploration then this will be right up your street. Odyssey is definitely a unique action platformer that doesn't get mentioned enough. Marvin's Marvelous Adventure was developed by Infernal Byte Systems and published by 21st Century Entertainment in 1994. Again, this also made it to the CD32. You play as a kid called Marvin, making his way through levels while collecting items. There are various enemies which can be killed by jumping on them, kicking them, or by throwing projectiles at them should you have them. Different enemies are susceptible to different forms of attack. 
There are also some soft puzzle elements, but overall it's really just some very slow and basic platforming, which is a shame as the game is so vibrant and colourful, taking full advantage of the AGA chipset's colours. It really needed to be pacier and have some more thrilling platforming elements. There are a lot of levels, but I'd be surprised if you see half of them before getting bored. I really wanted to like this game based off first appearances, but the lacklustre gameplay really lets it down. Kid Chaos was another one that made it to the Amiga and CD32, developed by Magnetic Fields and published by Ocean in 1994. This is definitely more akin to a 16-bit console platform game than any others featured here. It clearly drew inspiration from Sonic the Hedgehog, as is apparent from the pace and the level design. The levels have many similar features like checkpoint posts, swinging platforms and roller coaster like terrain, complete with springs to propel you forward. It actually managed to capture the feel of Sonic quite well, almost. It's fast, but not as fast as Sonic or say Zool on the Amiga. One major flaw in the pacing is that there are just so many traps, like spike pits, which you'll find yourself falling into far too often. This breaks up the flow of the game too much in my opinion. You play as a prehistoric kid wielding a club, but who's wearing modern clothing. This is explained in the intro as in being a young caveman who's been transported forward in time by time travelling scientists. Okay. The aim on each stage is to cause a set amount of destruction within a set time limit, which is done by bashing things with your club. To bash things, you just jump, and that's the only button available to you. Jumping sends him into a spin, with the club swinging around in all directions. Bashing enemies or environmental objects counts towards your destruction target, which is displayed as a countdown meter in the bottom left of the screen. Reduce the meter to zero, and the level's exit will open up. Each stage has a different destruction target and time limit, with some being vastly trickier, for example if they have a very short time limit. If you reach the end of the level and find the exit still closed, you'll need to backtrack to cause some more chaos. There are also occasional bonus stages which play like fixed vertical shooters where you shoot a gun at falling objects. The presentation is just fantastic, gorgeous graphics, perhaps some of the best on this list of platformers, with some good use of colour and some parallax scrolling thrown in for good measure. The music is equally well done, with upbeat dance music that sits well with the game's speed. Kid Chaos is really good, but it was almost great. If the flow of the levels was a bit more thought out and less unfair, it would have been a real Amiga Sonic contender. Naughty Ones was developed by Melon Design, published in 1994 by Interactivision. This is another one that also saw a CD32 release. Naughty Ones is a fixed screen platformer with levels consisting of single screens or a network of single screens displayed one at a time. The aim is to collect a key that will open up the level's exit while avoiding enemies and traps and collecting items. Some of the traps are reminiscent of Rick Dangerous, just without the blind jumps to your doom. By default you're armed with these bouncy ball projectiles which can be rebounded off walls to hit enemies. This is a double edged sword though as it can make it harder to hit enemies if they're too close. Items generally just award bonus points including coins left by fallen enemies but you can also collect different projectile weapons. Simple idea but it can be trickier than you would imagine at first glance. A lot of the enemies are in tight spaces or on short platforms so it can be difficult to kill before you take damage. It's very cutesy with its visuals and music, although the graphics won't wow any Amiga owners, I actually rather like them. Woody's World was released in 1993, developed by Vision and published by Acid Software. This is another simple one, all you have to do is reach the end of the level where you'll find an exit, but like Kid Chaos, the exit will only open if you've met the requirements. In this case, it's finding a certain number of treasure chests hidden throughout the level. You play as the titular Woody, an elf in a little wizard's costume. The only default actions are jump and firing these little stars. There are coins to collect for points and hearts to collect which grant an extra life if you gather enough of them. There are also power-ups which allow your character to jump higher, move faster and change your weapon. Collecting a scepter transforms Woody into Prince Woody, increasing your speed, jump and the distance your projectiles travel. He's also granted a sliding kick attack when in this state. 
collecting a crown transforms him into King Woody with even better speed and throwing distance. The ability to jump higher can be essential to completing the level as otherwise some treasure chests will be out of reach, so these power-ups are vital. The fact that the power-ups also speed up your character a bit is very much welcomed as it does feel very slow. It reminds me a lot of James Pond 2 with the gameplay and visuals just nowhere near as good. A lot of the chests are within secret rooms so you need to find and access these too. Some are even locked out unless you're in your King Woody guise. It's also very hard and on my first few tries I lost all my lives quite quickly. Just a bit boring really. Tear Away Thomas was developed and published by Global Software in 1993. This is another game where the exit only opens up after a set objective is completed. This is becoming a bit of a theme. Here you have to collect a number of gems scattered throughout the level within a set time. There are yellow gems and more valuable purple gems. Once you've collected enough, a message will appear informing you that the level's exit is open. The time limits are really strict though, so there's rarely much time for dawdling. The first thing I noticed about Terraway Thomas is his movement speed when jumping, which is insanely fast. So fast that it feels like a mistake, like you're playing on fast forward. This is too fast. But you do get used to it in time though, and it actually helps complete the levels quicker and beat that timer. Enemies are there solely to be avoided, you can't kill them. Getting hit by an enemy sends Thomas into a brief daze, which costs you valuable time. You do have lives, but these are lost when you run out of time. At face value I thought this would be awfully boring, but its speed is its saving grace. I mean, you're still only collecting gems as fast as you can, it doesn't get any more exciting than that, but I can see it appealing to people. So that was 20 of the Amiga's exclusive platform games, have you played any of these? Let me know, or just tell me what your favourite Amiga platformers are in general. See you on another instalment of this series soon, thanks for watching. You can find the rest of this series as it progresses in this playlist or check out one of my other Amiga related videos.